no way that he's just a, a, a giant kind of meathead who doesn't understand his roles are silly. Like, he gets... And I think that's the persona he wants. And you know what's interesting? He's gotten... We never know what happened on the Fast and the Furious world, but, I mean, they brought... He brought in The Rock. Like, like he gives all these people chances, and then they kind of give him the bad press. So, I, I don't know. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. But I guess people... Do you think they... You made a good point that people can maybe associate him with 80s, 90s action movies, kind of an antiquated type of character? Yeah, so I... When I first started thinking about Bloodshot... I was initially saying that he – this movie feels very 2000s, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's 2000s. I think it's this very specific time in the late 90s. This feels like 98, 97, 99, and, and that could be because at that point there was a lot of – how do I put this? Antihero going on. Got it. Like, more so than I think there, 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 more so than I think there is now. You had the cheeky villain who was kind of over the top a little bit, mm -hmm. and then you had – like Nick Cage, maybe. Well, no, he was really great in the late. He wasn't really an anti-hero, but like Face Off, a little bit of an anti-hero. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, I mean, I see, it, yeah, yeah. It, it gives this feeling of just like. Um, I mean, Transporter was an anti-hero. Yeah, Transporter definitely was. That's a great good point. It's like like this this kept pent up rage of like I can't I can't do the things I want to do and I'm angry about it. <laughs> I don't know if that Got makes quite, yeah. quite makes sense. Yeah. And that hasn't necessarily kept up like we still do anti-hero stuff now but it's not like it was previously and what i think some of the what i think happened here is that some of the critics latched onto that and are like this feels dated yeah. but it it's telling the story of something that was immensely popular in the 90s that was created in the 90s and of course it's going to feel a little bit dated and, and what's interesting is once we learn what the story is all of those kind of emotions all those things that he was going through and his missions were programmed. So and they made so much more sense and made them funny in retrospect. <laughs> yes, yeah, like so, especially the Toby Kebbell scene, where he's dancing to what Psycho Killer by Talking Heads in uh, socks and slippers, and he has a No Country for Old Men cow killer, and you take the trope of killing the wife, and then he actually kills Vin Diesel. But then later on, we learn that Eric, the programmer was the one who uses all those movie cliches and he programmed that and he gets chastised later on for doing that. And I, when I first saw that, I kind of laughed because the guys making fun of him was like, this isn't good enough. But the director of the place had to have approved it. So yeah. it's really his fault. <laughs> but it works though. Like I think Toby Kebbell has a fun little dance. And it, I love that scene. I it, absolutely I mean, love the scene. And yeah. then I kind of like it more that it was programmed like that in his head, just so he v envisions it. Like it's yeah. funny. It's funny to me. And even – so there are moments in movies, and I, I say this I say this a lot, and I actually teach this to my students, where there are movies that they seem written. And you, you're just like, oof, that's a – that line is written. Every line is written. But then there's other lines that play more naturalistic. You don't feel the writer's presence patting himself on the back. Does that make sense? There's no – Yeah. So when you watch Toby Kebbell dance, I didn't feel like it was a hyper-stylized, I'm the coolest person ever. No one's ever done this before. I just thought it was cheeky. And then when I learned that it was a program that was cliched and they made fun of him for it, it made me like it even more. And I didn't even Same. dislike it to begin with. Yeah. So you know what we should do? We should try to pinpoint all the movies that were ripped off in this opening scene. Oh, goodness gracious. Because when I was watching it, here are, the, here are the things that I thought of. And I bet we're probably close to the same same here. One, do you remember the game Counter-Strike? I do not. It's just, it's, it was a very popular game. It might still be popular. I don't know. But it was it basically felt like the opening scene when you're running around shooting guns and, and shooting into walls. So I, I thought about that. I think they definitely ripped off No Country for Old Men and Reservoir Dogs. Yep. And here's, <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. And here's one that I think is more subtle. I think they made an inside joke to the original Fast and Furious when his when he picks his wife up and holds her. Because they do that in the first movie, and it was a major part of the uh, advertising, which he, he did that with Michelle Rodriguez. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah they picked her up because that mm -hmm. was big in Fast and Furious. And also there's some, I would say, RoboCop in there. Yeah. Well, that's later on. Yeah. It would be really interesting if they would have leaned into this this a little bit more. <clears throat> yeah. I liked what you said about the comics, where the, the Valiant comics, where the things inside them worship them and can make them do other things. That would have... Oh, yeah. So let's, let's, let's tell everyone about that. So... So this movie is based off the character Bloodshot from Valiant Comics. It was a 
pretty popular character in the uh, 90s, and I would say relatively popular now, but nowhere near its nowhere near its peak. And there's been multiple iterations of this character, and different writers have done different takes on it, just like every single character out there, except maybe Batman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but one of the interpretation was was that the nanites in his body were somewhat sentient and worshipped him as a god. And that's something I would love to see in a sequel if it ever happens. It's such a crazy concept. Could you imagine a scene of like like Vin Diesel talking to Vin Diesel in his mind? Oh yeah, my god. <laughs> that needs to happen. And we talk I like, know. I like superheroes who have it's a blessing and a curse. So you have Hulk, right? You have yeah. Jean Grey or Storm. You can't really touch people. No, that's Rogue. Rogue, Rogue. can't really touch people. I like people whose powers it's like yeah, I'm powerful, but like it also sucks, but it's great. Does that make like I like that? Like, so it's Superman. What's really like I've never I've liked Superman movies, but I've never gotten into the comics because I never just thought what's the downside of this? Like what what what's terrible? But if if he's freezing up in the middle of a fight because his nanites are worshiping him, I mean that's that's hilarious. Like that's I don't know. I would love to see him play that and just go that route because I think Vin is capable of that. Of having some fun yes. with it. Yeah. So here's something interesting, Mark. I wrote my thesis in grad school on Superman. Oh, I don't know if you knew. Uh -oh. I don't know if you knew this. Shots fired. Uh, <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. So here's the thing about Superman. I always feel like I have to defend him. And I get the under interpretation that he has no enemies because he has all these powers. His struggle isn't that he can't overcome people, is that he is trying to do good in a world that's bad. Yes. It's all internal, which can be difficult to show in comic books. There's this there's a scene in one of the comics that I think illustrates illustrates like a, a potential for Superman that people don't really touch on. And Superman is talking to his cousin, who I believe is Supergirl, and they're talking about whether they can have sex with normal people. And Superman's just like, never. I mean, the, the implication is like he'll kill them by accident. He's like he's he's constantly has to be in control or he'll wreck everything. And it's a really sad poignant moment realizing that the most powerful man in the world is also incredibly lonely oh, okay well all right well i wish you hadn't told me that because I, <laughs> I like thinking of superman as a uh, you know boring but I, I like that that's good but he could be let's let's be honest he could be boring if it's just a a, a, a slug fest it's it is very boring you yeah. have to you have to be able to write him really well and a lot of people cannot write that character very well i thought his character in superman returns was kind of intriguing as this kind of loner like he, did, James Marsden saved the day in Superman Returns. Not oh like, yeah, definitely. Like, it's I like that kind of Superman. Yeah, I don't that know if I like unfairly maligned. I don't know if I like I like Henry Cavill a lot, and I I don't I I'll defend his Man of Steel fight at the end, but his whole sad fisherman thing I didn't really buy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean that's that's the character's point of view. It's like he's trying to come to grips with he can he has all these powers that he can't show or do anything with, and he doesn't know what to do with them again it's just it's an internal internal character which is just not shown very well in a lot of places but i feel this, like we're also going way abreast of bloodshot right like, but, no i think we're but i, I kind of like that we're looking at i mean this is a superhero movie and so i kind of like looking at other superheroes because like you said valiant this character was is not a wholly original character oh no and, not at all and so it's kind of interesting, too, when people said that this movie bar Like, somebody said that this movie borrows from Memento. And I'm like, yeah, but this character was created before Memento. <laughs> so that shows <laughs> the depth of research people did on this. This is, a, like, a big thing. Like, I, I, I'm like, wait a second. But my, uh, that blew my mind. I, I kind of had to stop reading these reviews about this movie. Because, like we said, there's very little actual data about this movie since it's so new research about this movie. I, we do know that the budget's $45 million. I do know that the special effects were by Weta, which are which is awesome. The practical mm -hmm. effects. The director Dave Wilson was in visual effects. He did one of the episodes in Love, Death, and the Robots. He had worked with Marvel before and done video games. I like that Tom Brown, the production designer, dudes worked on Saving Private Ryan, Dune, Denny Villeneuve's Dune, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, Spy, and the latest Tomb Raider. So this movie and the the cinematographer has done all the Purge movies and had recently worked on Mile Twenty Two. So I think that they're – oh, uh, one more thing i got to read, which I love. The second unit director and the guy who did a lot of the stunts in this film, who who did a lot of those, his name is J.J. – where is he at? I have all of his movies over here. i got to find his name. I'm getting there. Second unit director. Let's see. And, of course, when I say I have it, I can't find it, but I'm going to go to full cast and crew. 
So the second unit director was, here we go, we're getting there, J.J. Perry. And I don't know if you know this, but he was the stunt coordinator on John Wick 2. This dude was in, he was Scorpion in Mortal Kombat Annihilation. He was Johnny Cage's stunt double in Mortal Kombat, Paul Anderson's movie. He's worked on Fate of the Furious, Warrior. He won Stuntman of the Year in 2003 for the run, Rundown. I mean, this guy just worked, he was a stunt coordinator on Fast 9, this guy. He was a stunt coordinator on Skyscraper. So, I mean, the guy who directed Second Unit and did the stuns in this movie is a massive name. He's also He also did Last Witch Hunter, London Has Fallen, Mechanic Resurrection. So, like, there's a lot of talent, man. And they took this $45 million and they made it look good. And I guess a case in point is, I, I like the set when, so Vin gets brought in. He gets killed, but then he wakes up, and then he finds out that he's become a super soldier. He meets the three other super soldiers that are there, and eventually at night, he goes to work out because he can't sleep. So he learns he can bench press 1,000 pounds, curling 200 pounds is easy. He destroys a load-bearing concrete pole, which is insane. But I like that a lot of these shots are lit by the pool in the background. It's a very thoughtful, interesting thing, and I know there's a weird synchronized swimming bit, from Isaac Gonzalez, but I don't know. I, it's a unique set that's lit interestingly enough, and there's a lot of excellent overhead shots. So there's a flower fight for Pete's sake. So I don't. I, yeah. I, I I think this 45 million, all of it's on screen, and I think everyone seems very passionate about the outcome of it. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that gets back to us viewing this movie in terms of what it's trying to be, and not in terms of what we want it to be. Yes. Like, yes. This is this is a journeyman craftsman movie this is i believe this is the director's first full-length yes. film mm -hmm. so like in in everything that has happened in this film i think it's a radical success and i'm actually really bummed out that it's it, it got got hamstrung by the pandemic and i i know that it's doing it's doing well on amazon relatively but you're not, they're not going to recruit recoup the same amount of money on amazon as a 20 dollars purchase as they would in the theaters yeah um so I guess the question this leads into is, like, do you think the Valiant universe is is tanked? Yeah. I mean, the tough thing is, it's if, if it's not tanked, it's not going to get the budgets it wanted. To make another one, it's going to need the same 40 million budget. So they're going to have to be in these, they're going to have to keep being these scrappy film like this one. So I don't think, yeah. I, I think, uh, man, if they make another one, it's a 40 million budget. And that's a scrappy little picture. So they're just going to have to go... The John Wick route or go somewhere like that to bring in more like budget conscious fight scenes. Yeah. In terms of Valiant, what I am really shocked with is that they chose Bloodshot instead of what I think is probably their most popular character with it, which is Ninjek, uh, which is a Batman analog. And just to clear this up, Bloodshot is essentially a combination of Wolverine and uh, Captain America. So I, <laughs> there's no such thing as original concept in Valiant. Let's just be frank. But I don't want to like shit on them because there's really no such thing as an original idea, period. <laughs> so, I mean, like everyone's just, just stealing from everyone else. Like, don't you have Wade Wilson was Slade Will like Slade Wilson? I mean, it's just that's where Deadpool got his name from somebody else. Like it's I don't know, there's there's Superman esque character. There's eight variations of superman so you mean I, shazam <laughs> yeah exactly so it's kind of yeah oh but we'll make him a kid so it's it's better so right and so i don't get the the hate on this when everything cannibalizes from each other the weird i think people do it when they ha either have an agenda or they don't like the person or they didn't like the movie but if you love the movie i mean all right listen parasite was not the first movie about class warfare right no it was not at all and it wasn't the first thriller where people ingratiate themselves into people's lives so the plot is new, but it's not the first kind of class warfare type picture. I'm not shitting on Parasite because I love that movie, but does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I get it. I maybe you picked know, the wrong movie, but... One of the things that I have discovered while being a movie critic, a fledgling movie critic, even though I've been doing this forever, <laughs> is um, it's easier to write a negative review than it is to write a positive review. Yeah. It's more interesting to write a negative review. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like a lot of people put more effort into their negative reviews than they do their positive reviews. Yeah. I'm, I guess if you write a zinger of a line about a movie, it's going to get more press than, yeah, Bloodshot is a totally adequate $45 million movie that features some, uh, some inspired fight scenes, uh, you know, an international cast, and an economical approach that will prove to be a fun diversion during this time. Like, no one's yeah, gonna... Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Hey, that's really good. <laughs> that is really good. You should put that on a poster. <laughs> Shoot. Crap. 